My dream short film was dead in the water, but now I'm very excited to share that not only is it back, it's looking stronger than ever. Now, why was it dead in the first place? Well, we lost a bunch of funding for this very expensive project, so that wasn't great. But also, there were a couple of big story problems that we eventually found, and we had no idea how to fix it. And this was very demoralizing when coupled with, you know, losing all the money. Fortunately, we made exciting progress on both these fronts. And before I tell you what's happening with the production, first, I wanna show you how we found and then fixed a very fundamental problem with our script because it's a perfect example of a common writing mistake that's so easy to make and I know it'll help you write and rewrite your own films better if you just keep this case study in mind. And by the way, this principle doesn't just apply to shorts and features. If you're telling literally any type of story, you're gonna need this. And my writing partner, Chris Fornatero, who I've co-written a bunch of features and a lot of short films right here on this channel with, also teaches oil painting on YouTube over on the Paint Coach channel. And while I was working on some production challenges with this film, my co-producer, co-writer Chris was focused on finding fixes to our script situation. And after a lot of long phone calls, we finally narrowed down to what the problem actually was. And it just cracked the code to all these other story problems. And like a snowball rolling down the hill, we found solutions to everything in one fell swoop. So in his first time on the channel, here's Chris to explain the basics of our story and the problems that we discovered in it. Hey there, I'm Chris Fornatero, and I've been helping Ken out on this by working on the script. You can download it from a link in the description of this video. Now, if you haven't read the script, you can totally pause this video and check it out, but I'm gonna give a very short, brief summary of the last version of the script. I'm gonna be leaving out a lot of good, juicy details, so again, definitely check out the script. But the way it went was, we open up, it's in the middle of nowhere in Alaska in 1899 in the height of the Alaskan gold rush. And we see Oliver all alone panning for gold in the river. It's just him and his dog in a tent about 20 or 30 yards off of the river. We see him find some gold, but he senses something is watching them in the woods. He then takes his gold into the woods. He walks by a Native American totem pole letting us know that this is native territory and he arrives at a cave. This is where he stashes his gold and it is booby trapped. He has put a trip wire with dynamite to keep people from coming inside. Once inside the cave, we see him measure and log his gold and then place it on his big pile of gold that is the size of a small car at this point. Oliver then returns back to his tent on the river where he is visited by what was watching him in that first scene which was the Otter Man. This is a real Native American myth. It's a river spirit that is half man, half otter, and can shape shift into anything or anyone. This Otter Man emerges from the river and shape shifts into Oliver's father who warns him that people back in town have found out about his gold in the cave and that he needs to go and protect it. So Oliver grabs his pickaxe, heads back to the cave, finds the men in his cave with his gold, but the men are from modern times. They have cameras, they have lights. We are in modern times and now we see Oliver for what he really is, which is a half skeleton ghost. He's been a ghost this whole time, haunting this river and haunting this cave, keeping people away from his gold. So again, it's very important to know what a character wants and why they want it. In this version, it's clear what he wants. He wants more gold but we don't know exactly why he wants that. I mean, me and Kent knew why he wanted it. He wanted to be able to bring it back home to his family as a hero, but I feel like we never got that across to the audience. And getting that across will make the audience root for Oliver more and want him to get what he wants. An example of this is Walter White and Breaking Bad. If you just saw Walter White cooking and selling meth and getting lots of money, but you didn't know why, like you didn't see that he had a family and that he was doing it for them, it wouldn't be as interesting and you wouldn't follow along with him and care about him as much. So that element was just nowhere in that first version. We needed to put that in. And when it comes to telling the audience what the main character wants and why, the earlier the better. And this is a short film, so we have to get this in quick. So I was like, oh, what if we put it in that first scene? What if, while he's painting for gold, he doesn't find any, and then he sees a vision of his wife standing in the river, and she points him to the right place on shore to look for gold, and he finds it. And once he finds it, she disappears. And now see, doing that does a lot of things. One, we see how much Oliver wants to be with his wife, and he wants to go back to her. He misses her. You know, this getting this gold is for her. So we accomplish that. Also, we show how the river spirit works. The audience might not realize this until the end or a second viewing, but this vision of his wife isn't from him being delirious and being out in the wilderness for so long. It's the river spirit taking the form of his wife 
and showing him where more gold is to keep him out there. So that's one big change that we made. The next change was a scene right after that in the tent. We show Oliver talking to his dog and telling him that they almost have enough gold to go back home and buy the modest house that he wants to have for him and his wife to have kids in. So we get to hear why Oliver wants this gold so bad. We get to hear his hopes and dreams after having enough gold. Now the next big change that we made is that when he goes to stash his gold in the cave, we don't show how much gold he has yet. So at this point, the audience thinks that he's just a normal gold miner wanting to collect a modest amount of gold to return home with and have a good life. See, now when the audience sees how much gold he actually does have at the end, it's gonna paint Oliver in a completely different light. It's gonna make him look crazy because he has way much more gold than he needs. He should have left long ago but he didn't. Another thing we played with was when the Otter Man comes to Oliver in the form of his father. He added some information to paint a clear picture of what his relationship was with his father and how he really wanted to bring home this gold for his approval. And see, now doing all these things is going to give the audience a very specific feeling at the end of the movie. And Ken and I have been talking about this a lot right from the beginning of the project, which is we really want the audience to leave with this sad feeling that Oliver never got to realize his hopes and dreams. He never got to bring back all that gold to his family because the Otter Man had exploited his greed and cursed him to never be satisfied with the amount of gold that he had. And he's stuck out there for all of eternity, panning for gold that he'll never have enough of. And we could never get the audience to have that feeling if we weren't clear on what he wanted and why he wanted it. All right, I gotta get back to work. So at the end of the day, we did the one thing that from the very beginning we had said to make sure not to do. We lost sight of the human story at the root of the film, the emotional heart of the whole thing. And instead, the flashiness of the genre elements, the twist ending, the Otter Man creature, all these things took over the story. But the lost fortune of Oliver Brody, the actual fortune was never supposed to be the giant pile of gold that he stashed in the cave. Sure, that's the genre, that's the cool factor, but it's a much more powerful film if we always remember that the real lost fortune of Oliver Brody is the woman he never made his way back to because of his unquenchable greed. She died a century ago waiting for him, and he's trapped down the wilderness hoarding gold for eternity, deluding himself into thinking he'll bring it back to her soon. That's the story we wanted to tell. And it seems obvious, right? To make sure your main character wants something, make that clear to the audience, but whenever you're even a little bit muddy about this, it just causes so many sneaky problems in your script. So quickly to illustrate this, here's all the big story problems that we had noticed in the previous draft, which again is linked below if you wanna read it, and how just remembering to focus on what our character wants gave us the answers to fix them all. So first off, we had a weak opening scene, a weak hook to this whole story. Now, originally we had Oliver panning for gold in the river and he senses that he's being watched by something. We don't see the Otter Man who's watching them. And he's carrying around a mummified human foot, which was this whole other convoluted thing where the foot would fend off the Otter Man, but it's never fully explained. And it just seemed like too busy for this film. And it didn't clue us in on the Oliver character very much. It didn't set up how the Otter Man works. It didn't make us root for Oliver or get our footing in the story really. But again, by making sure to focus on what Oliver wants and why he wants it immediately from the gate, we came up with a striking visual. Okay, well let's have the Otter Man turn into his sweetheart, have her just standing in the water and then give a flash of an otter tail coming off of her. And now we one, get to see his reaction. We get to see and show how deeply he wants to be back with his sweetheart back home. We get to understand that there's a shape-shifting otter who's haunting the river. Uh, we get to really early on, just kind of understand how that works. And we get a much stronger hook. It roots us into the story, sets the stakes immediately, and we know what Oliver wants. So just by focusing on that, we found a better scene. Another huge problem that I honestly didn't realize until I filmed the last video about pre-production and I had to like verbally beat by beat pitch the whole story is that Oliver goes back and forth from his tent to the cave twice back to back, and it feels repetitive in a bad way. It loses momentum on the story, like going back to that cave like again immediately. It's just seemed crazy. And the cave scenes are also probably gonna be the hardest parts of this thing to film. 
probably the most expensive, so something had to be done there. Now, the first scene inside the cave, story-wise, was revealing that Oliver already has a fortune in gold. And this contradicted what our character wanted in the first place. He wants to go home as soon as he has enough gold to, you know, buy a house and start a life with his sweetheart. So when the audience sees this giant pile of gold, that goal is trash. It's not useful. They, they turn on Oliver. They know he's delusional and they don't know what or who to root for again until the very end. It just complicates the story in a bad way. So it would be better if this reveal of how big his gold stash already is happened at the end, right before we see Oliver's true form as a ghost. So that way the whole film has us rooting for Oliver up until the very end when we realize, oh, we've been rooting for a delusional hoarding monster. So to do this, the only way to do it is we must lose that first scene with Oliver and his dog inside the cave where he lies back on his giant pile of gold and blah, 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 even though we loved it. There's just no other answer. So we had to kill a darling there. But fortunately, by withholding the audience seeing the inside of the cave and just showing him go in there with a sack of gold, come back out with no sack of gold, we now create a sense of mystery and a much, much bigger payoff for the ending when we finally do get to go inside this dank, creepy cave and see the cobweb-covered mountain of gold inside it. It's a, an extra reveal and it simplifies production too because it saves us money and it cuts our screen time inside this difficult cave location in half. Another major problem, we felt like the ending never brought the story back to the emotional side of Oliver's journey. It was all about the twist horror elements of the film. But by having Oliver just repeat a line in the dark echoey cave that he already says in the film when he's staring at the photo of his sweetheart, we have time, my love. That's what he says. And then he says a similar thing a couple other times in the film, like, oh, we have time when he's seeing if he has time to go to the cave in the first place. But just repeating this line, we have time, my love, at the very end, besides being just a gothic, creepy thing to say after murdering somebody, the dramatic irony fully lands for the audience that this woman who died over 100 years ago, and Oliver still thinks he has time to be with her, it's never gonna happen, it's tragedy. And it's a better ending, it's more emotional, and again, by bringing the story's focus back to what Oliver wanted in the first place, the story comes full circle, it's more satisfying, and it's more emotional. Now, I hope I didn't go too in the weeds with all this. In fact, it fixed some other little story problems, and we made a bunch of tweaks throughout the script based on this refocusing on what our character wants. But even though writing can feel dry to explain, this is literally the most important creative work we'll ever do on the film. We're gonna be spending so much money, so much time, so much energy on this project that we need to know the story is gonna work. We need to have the full confidence in this script so that we can feel great about dedicating so much of ourselves to bringing it to life. Most importantly, we need to know how the audience will feel at every step as they follow along on this tale that we're gonna be telling. So. Focusing on the main character's goal is just the best and simplest North Star for accomplishing all of that. It's useful for every short film. It's useful for every single story you might want to tell. Every film has this at the heart of it. Look at any of the short films on the channel here. The Little Helpers, you have a character who just wants to survive. You have another character who wants to kill Santa Claus. You got Last Laugh Inc. You just have a character who just wants to laugh because he's going through a sad moment. So these are their goals. And by the way, if you like those short films, those were made on really tight budgets, but they share one other thing in common that helped boost the production value and make them more fun to watch, and that's great music from this video's sponsor, Artlist, which can come in handy for the little helpers. I created a collection of tracks on Artlist while I was still writing and shot listing that film, since I knew I'd be using their tracks in the final film, since, you know, couldn't afford to hire a composer for that thing. So they've just curated the best library I've seen for stock tracks that don't sound like stock tracks, and they add new music and sound effects daily, so their library is just massive. And I love that you can search by any combination of genre, mood, BPM, duration, vocals, whatever. You can even click a button to find similar tracks to one that you already like, which is 
incredibly useful. They have different pricing plans. Find whatever one works for you. They got a lower cost social plan if you just want to use their music and sound effects for your YouTube channel, for example. Right now I'm rocking the Artlist Max plan, which also gives you their stock footage, which is amazing, and their editing templates and graphics, which are big time savers that I use all the time. So if you make money with video content, Artlist pays for itself so quickly by just being a one-stop shop for all these assets, not having to spend hours searching for each asset and paying for it a la carte. If you click the link below or scan the QR code here, you'll get two months free when you sign up for any of their annual plans. Thank you, Artlist, for supporting this channel and for all the great assets for filmmakers, editors, and storytellers of all kinds. Speaking of which, let's get back to the takeaways from this case study, huh? So look, no matter what type of story you're trying to tell, ask yourself this question at every step of writing and rewriting it. What does this character actually want? Why does he want it so bad? Why does he want it right now? And what's stopping him? These questions are the backbone of every story. And if you get a little vague or unclear about any of them or lose sight of them in favor of a tangent or a cool vibe that you're chasing, everything will start falling apart like a house of cards. So to sum it up, if your script isn't as strong as you want, ask yourself, am I pointing my main character at a clear goal and making them fight like hell for it on every page? I hope you enjoyed that little writing lesson as much as we enjoyed rediscovering it. I feel like I have to rediscover the basics of storytelling on every single film I make. I don't know if any of us ever really outgrow that. The fundamentals are kind of everything. But I wanted to let you know I'm making a playlist on my channel here for all of these making of videos. So expect many more videos documenting every step of making this big short film. But I don't want to just do status update videos, you know, I'll make them provide real value based on whatever we learn along the way. So you'll learn everything that we learn. That's the goal. But until my next video, here's some big news on the production side of the film. Casey Bornell has joined as DP, colorist, and producer of this thing, which is huge. I met him back in the day working on corporate videos for Netflix. And since then, he's colored my short films Hawaii and Last Laugh Inc. Does a lot of work in commercials as a DIT, producing, coloring, shooting. He's an absolute technical wizard. He's an artist behind the camera, plus a lover of the outdoors. So he's at just perfect for this project. And it was really him coming on board that motivated me to continue working on the film, despite having just lost the budget. You know, see my pre-pro video uh, for more on that whole thing. But we've been holding weekly production meetings to keep on track and moving forward. We're aiming for spring or early summer 2025 to shoot this thing, which gives us plenty of time to chip away at this behemoth project. We also have our first production money in the bank from a new sponsor for this film. More on that coming down the line. And through a friend, we may have found our main location. It's out in Montana, but it would be totally free once we all got out there. So I'm hoping to do a location scout this month before the weather and the foliage changes too much so we know what we'd actually be getting into. And I think that would make a great next video in this series too. By the way, if you're a company who's interested in sponsoring this film and it's making up videos, we're still looking for sponsors. So shoot me an email with the email address in my description and uh, let's talk, huh? It's a really expensive project, but it's gonna be worth it. Pinky swear. And if you want to follow along with this project more, join my weekly newsletter, Friday Film Notes. It's free, it's delightful, it's full of filmmaking insights, and I'll even toss you some useful freebies like my short film producing template as a thank you. And that's all for now. Let's make some movies.